all those dark lines that you see running around the building, those were, are where trenches are going to be excavated for full perimeter foundations for all the buildings. The original foundations are really, at least the really early ones, are all brick piers. And then the second thing is, is when you start poking into the soil in an army base that, that has a, and it goes back to the 1860s, uh, the buildings have been painted many, many times with lead-based paint. And so a lot of that is in the soil, and what we needed to do was to clean up the soil. And so there was a, a, an arm wrestling match between the lead-based paint people and the archaeologists to try and figure out what do we do next. And the first thing we tried to do is, is uh, we tried to reduce the scope of what the archaeological testing would be in this area. And um, we reduced it down literally to hand pouring augers into the ground around where any kind of ground disturbance would occur. And then the samples for the lead were pulled based on that to, in order to gauge how much soil needed to actually be removed. And then we started calculating. We decided to wait for the archaeology to figure out how much we would have to do and how, what further we'd have to do when the lead sort of got pulled. So um, that's how the project is sort of got underway. I mean, there's a lot of other aspects to it. Uh, Joe Costa here and uh, Catherine Robles, who are both uh, directly involved as sort of the project managers on this thing. Um, there's a whole other set of stories about the buildings themselves. But today, we're going to go under them and around them. So uh, Point San Jose and Fort Mason uh, it was not always the way that it seems. It wasn't this simple, quiet little place. Um, it actually had a lot of different activities going on. And as you go farther back in time, the place is changing. It's a very different world. This is a picture of, of uh, one of the, uh, the earlier buildings in 1905. In 1906, there's a lot of uh, basically evacuees who come to uh, the, the point, uh, sorry, Fort Mason area, and uh, there are a whole bunch of evacuation camps that are set up. None out in the main post area that I was describing, uh, the Point San Jose area. They're much more on the exterior and down into the what became the Marina District. This is more about a time like this earlier picture, perhaps from the 1850s, or, I'm sorry, from the 1860s, uh, when the, it was a simple little post with its main uh, parade ground, almost like on Franklin Street, if anybody knows where that is. Um, it's kind of like the divide between the main set of buildings in this direction and the, the house, the four or five houses, including the officers uh, club, that is on the, the hillside overlooking uh, Fisherman's Wharf. The hospital, this is what it looked like in 1961. And uh, I'm just going to jump right into it. Here's the archaeology as it started. It began with training. Archaeologists need to be trained in order to work in the lead-based soils to start with. Because if we were working around, or they were, it was a contract, so if they were working around the structures, they had to be in Tyvek, the soils had to be treated as hazardous materials. And as a result of that, there was a lot of fretting on my part about whether or not we would actually learn what was in the area. The reason why we were doing the archaeology was twofold. The first is, is that there are prehistoric sites at Fort Mason. There's as many as five of them. And two of them are on either side of this project area. So we had the assumption that no one had ever really looked under these houses, and that they, that might actually be one large prehistoric site. That turned out not to be true. There's no prehistoric site where these buildings are. In fact, what there is is a lot of dune sand. And so on the topographic maps where you see a mounding in this area where the buildings were constructed, it's a dune that's sitting there. And, there, and at least in terms of the depth that we went, like eight feet or so, that there is no prehistoric site unless it's deeper and a dune built up over quite a lot of time over it. So they got their training. They went to work, sometimes in Tybeck, sometimes not when they're far enough away from the buildings. Uh, it's too bad. It's a little it's a, too bright in here. But this is the area um, where the discovery was made. This is the morning of October 25th, the day that the discovery was made. 
literally, uh, this was a Monday, and on the Friday before that, Joe, the archaeological monitor who was following this project, and myself sat in this cove and talked about the fact that the monitoring was suggesting a lot of isolated artifacts were coming out of this area where they were digging, and you can see now a little better, the uh, area that had been excavated already for to remove the lead soils. So the archaeological testing didn't show any archaeological features. And that means that there's a feature is largely not just one artifact, but it's actually a whole mess of them together. Sometimes in a visible and understandable pit feature or something like that. Or in a layer where materials have been thrown out of a building or something like that. Uh, kind of what, what's called a scree sometimes. Yeah. Um, though, yeah? Maybe a little too dark. What do you want to do? <laughs> it's harder to see if the, the, the interpreter is away. We can, once we get, um, you can turn the lights back up because once you get the general idea, we can, you can just kind of fake it and uh, you'll understand what's going on. All right? Thank you. So basically on that Friday, we were talking about the need to actually start to look. When the lead soils were being excavated, we had a sense that there were no archaeological features in this area. It didn't mean we weren't finding artifacts. The artifacts seemed to be showing up in an isolated way, but the date of the, of the artifacts and the age of them suggested that the his, older historic objects were all showing up in this area and in, in certain areas around the hospital building. And so what we noticed is that there was visible stratigraphy, layers in the soil that had been removed. And we decided the next step would be that we would take a look at a controlled sample of each of those layers to determine whether or not it's really just one or more of those layers that were producing these isolated pieces. We were still trying to get at things like, what's the original grade? and the ground surface for 18, say, 60s or 70s. And uh, so we were all planning to move on that on Monday when this was found. So pretty much in the area in the lower right corner of the screen, um, where the pipe is coming through the ground, uh, they started to excavate just a little bit more soil uh, to over-excavate because they were still getting high lead readings and they needed to pull a little bit more soil out of this area. And as they began to do that, they uncovered a, a series of basically their human long bones. So leg bones, uh, whether the, the femur or the bottom of the leg. And they're covered with a large cap of, uh, it almost looks like a stove piece. Um, and a piece of a stove, like the cover on the front of the stove. When that was lifted, it became evident that basically that stove piece was in place covering a feature that was filled with human remains. And when they popped that up, uh, basically that, the whole the difference in what you see there is actually you're looking down into this pit of bone and where sand had not accumulated. So there's all the little vacant spaces between the bones as deep as you can see. So, at that point, the place became, initially, it started to get lined off as a crime scene. And the, the, uh, basically, the coroner's office was contacted in relation to state law and also in relationship to our, uh, it's the kind of thing that we do when we find human remains. First thing you do is you call the coroner. The coroner comes out, examines it, they determine whether or not there's a, it's a crime scene and the medical examiners decided that it was not. We were trying to describe to them that what was being found when this was hit was it seemed to be human remains, but it was with a whole bunch of rather old historic objects. And we were trying to explain that we thought it was an archaeological site and a pit, and they concurred with us. And uh, they left the site with, I think, a comment that there were enough human remains in here to uh, make it through the carpool lane. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
make a note on make a note on that. The note is they're looking at the surface of a pit. No idea of how deep it goes. And so we have gone all the way down to the bottom of that pit and recovered this material. And we're going to be going back to the medical examiner from the coroner's office to have another discussion. And you'll see why in a minute. By the way, at the time, they also made the determination that um, some skull fragments that were found were not Native American, and it was determined that this, this was not a prehistoric feature as well. So it was released back to the park, and we came in with the issues with the lead removal. We decided to recover this feature to understand it better, and rather than just to cap it and forget about it. So the next thing that happened is, of course, the media arrived before we really had a sense of what, what we were going to be doing next. And, uh, and the media was, was uh, handled happily by the, uh, the public affairs. And so Howard explained the situation to them after I explained the situation to Howard. And, <laughs> and they just kept coming. <laughs> And so public affairs put out a notice that was kind of a summation, literally on the first day when you're just trying to get your bearing and you've got like vertigo about what you're going to do about this feature. Um, but they went ahead and put together a little briefing that went out and it's like the thing that AP used and it went out everywhere and it's really short and uh, it would be really nice someday if there was a way to put the actual findings out rather than that first blur that goes out. Because sometimes that first blurb is the only thing that people ever find out about the thing. So as we started to uh, basically uh, set up a grid and determine our location and get a map started on this feature, that's what it looked like. I hope everybody can see it, but if not, I've got plenty more of that. <laughs> this is the surface of the feature. So the top of the ground level is a little bit above the large pipe in the top. The, cast iron pipe heading to the, uh, what literally is the sewer trap. And that's the original ground surface. So it's that far down, and there's all this additional material that's been placed on it over time. Not well explained at the site. It's not like we had the opportunity to do test excavation pits. Remember, we did auger holes. And it's also not like we were able to do a strap trench so that you'd understand where original grades were. So we're trying to still get our sense of where everything is at. We're keeping everything as intact as possible. And even if the pit is showing down here, this is the last piece of evidence of the original ground surfaces over time above the pit. So this part had to be excavated along with the bottom part. Well, not along with it, but the data had to be collected in order to understand, for example, if the pit grows farther into it, the portions it actually belongs. So slowly but surely, we began to, to take each of the layers off of that large bulk of soil in the middle of the yard. And um, I, it became kind of like a, a Mark Twain novel. It's like people started showing up left and right, wanting to hail. And, and, and so we let them help. We defined things that were manageable for them to do, and depending on what they already knew, and it was like painting a white fence and getting out the paintbrush and telling everybody how cool it was. <laughs> and yeah, of course, there's rain coming. That and earthquakes. So the process was slow, laborious, but, but very at the simplest level, what it was was recording the feature in plan and then very carefully brushing down the bone, exposing a layer of the bone kind of like a game of pickup sticks. But what we were looking for to start with was whether or not there were articulations. Is this a burial or is this a waste pit from the hospital? Is it composed of amputation parts or is it something else? Is it part of a cemetery that was associated with the hospital? I'm not really sure which, what all the answers are for that yet, but there were no articulations. And as we went down through this pit, the upper layer was almost like um, a, a disposal, like at the end of cleaning up a hospital, you might sweep it all up, all the broken everything, and you might throw it on top. So it was 
mixture of bones and broken glass and all sorts of artifacts. Below that, someone was taking the trouble to throw in a waste pit human remains and organize them first. So the long bones were over here, and the back bones were in a big higgledy-piggledy pile next to them. And next to that were skulls, and next to that were hand and feet bones. I don't know, really have an explanation for it other than it sure looked scientific. And below that, we began to actually find at the very bottom of the pit articulated parts, but no complete skeleton. And at the very bottom, there was a child, but without a head. Okay. So the process is, was a long one that we thought would be over each day. And each day, at the end of the day, we were kind of amazed that each layer that we cleaned, recorded, and then went down the next layer of what was removable just kept going. Eventually, we found ourselves uh, coming up against the rain, and uh, Scott Jones was, was uh, able to get us actually a cover which was perfect for that one day where it was raining. Lots of people assisted. That's my son. And that's Scott Jones. And that's Castro Robles. That's some other people. <laughs> that's Abby Sue and Tim Spillane, who was the archaeologist monitoring the project. This was some, some guy that wandered off the street. And a bunch of, this is what it was like when we looked up in that alcove. Art's, Art's maintenance crew was working hard on getting the building set up. But every time you turned around, every window in that alcove had like a, a peanut gallery watching us. And, uh, and strangely enough, um, Jesse on the left here uh, got nicknamed Madame Cleo during this as a psychic. And he actually made a comment about what he expected to, us to find at the bottom of the pit. And he was dead on. It was where we got through all these remains and came down on articulated remains. So you just put that one in the book anywhere you want. <laughs> Again, an example of another layer as we got it cleaned off, and it's one that, that shows the profusion of waste material from the hospital that's actually directly associated with all these materials. This isn't a purposeful internment like a cemetery. This is much closer to disposal associated with waste from a hospital. So each layer was carefully bagged, removed, and then more was excavated. The plans continued, and the pit itself stayed pretty much in place. In other words, it didn't get bigger, it didn't, and then Scott started fooling around. And the next thing that happened is he started to find another pit or another feature. It turned out to be a small addendum to this that was over to the side at one level. And so at, at some time, a pit had been dug into the ground that was, say, yay big. And there was also some parts that were thrown over to the side. And what slowly emerged was a momentary sort of, as the pit was filled, there's a point where it got a little bigger and then it got smaller. The human remains that were found in it included skulls, and that's what was really starting to bother us. Because usually you don't amputate a skull because it, the patient dies. <laughs> so, and the one odd thing that showed up is the one skull that I would happen to touch and to carefully remove had buttons in its eyes. And uh, we're still working on that and following that thread through. And it may have been totally just sort of fortuitous that buttons ended up there. There were very few buttons in the entire deposit. No clothing, actually, almost at all, except for a few buttons. And uh, some people thought it was an Afro-American trait. Some people thought it was a Native American trait. It sort of harkens to coins in the eyes. And coins in the eyes is an old Western civilization trait that relates to having those coins to pay Sharon at the river Styx so that you can get across to the land of the dead. 
But what this means is that that person would have had to have somebody who knew that put those things in those eyes. <clears throat> Continue. More layers and more layers. But as we got through one part, other portions started to show up, and by the end of the week, we're into more articulated backs, arms, shoulders with back pieces, pelvises with backs. Some of the cuts in the bone that were showing up, a lot of them were amputations. So there would be arm and leg bones, things of that nature. But there were others that just didn't make immediately a lot of sense. Um, and one of the best ways we knew about this is actually one of the people, Kate, who was working on the project, her father, who's a family practitioner, was there and actually became our resident sort of like bonk on, on bones to the point that it was intriguing listening to him talk about all those landmarks. And in looking at these, some of the backbones were cut straight across. There's no particular reason that you would do something like that unless you were breaking the body down in order to put it in the ground. Then the way that the bodies were laying in this mass of bones, they weren't placed in the ground. At first we thought that maybe there was still tissue on them when, there was placed in, when they were placed in the ground. But more and more it became evident that these were bones that were being buried, not body parts in whole. So they went through a process someplace that resulted in them being bones, and then they went into the ground later. How did you determine that? By the way that they were sitting. Um, when you look at a, a pile of backbones, first of all, if they're individual vertebra in a pile that has not been moved, and they're all disarticulated, they're not joined together, there were some that are like those, but above, the pile is the majority of them were individual pieces. There's enough uh, muscle and different parts of the body, the way they're hooked together, is that you'd be spending a lot of time trying to get it down to that level and then put it in the ground with all the flesh and everything still on it. Enjoying your lunch? <laughs> <laughs> so let's get out of the bones, and that's it. You're probably not going to see these bones again. Uh, well, maybe a few more shots in here. But you're not going to see these again because we're following some threads about these bones that, um, that it's not appropriate to show these anymore. And so that's it. Um, but I'm not done talking. <laughs> Does it suggest that the bones were rendered somewhere to remove all of the... We thought about that. We thought that that brick feature that turned out to be a sewer trap might be an incinerator. And we were actually, we have found there were apparently a lot of uh, cremated pieces that we were finding. Occasionally the bones had scorch marks on them, but generally none of that. And so the rendering that would have taken place would have been more like uh, a boiling or you know something to break it down by a liquid. So then we got the stuff over to the lab and uh, and the and the whole the white wash painting defense, this is fun, join in thing continued. We have it had an intern, Jeremy, who has been working on some of that. We've, the, the materials that came in were in very large bags, and we got them up and out of the bags because um, the lab is still in the process of being, uh, the new lab is actually in the process of being constructed, and there are windows on the south side were letting in the sun on that really nice warm day we had a few days ago. And uh, all the bags were starting to get condensation on them, so all the bones came up, out, sorted, a lot of them got cleaned off, although there's a lot more to be done, and they were put onto racks in association with the layers that they came from. This is an example of not the <coughs> controlled excavation. This is an example of all those isolated pieces that were showing up on the project site before the discovery was made. So many pieces that if you were doing an archaeological survey, you'd start by calling this an archaeological site, which I was doing. <coughs> We were also working with them in terms of a negotiation about lead and other things. And the nature of reality sometimes shifts slightly in terms of the definitions that you bring to bear in trying to deal with the situation. So these things were not features like I described, but these individual artifacts were in profusion. It's an example of some of the materials. Uh, somebody mentioned the name of this one. It was a ceramic that I was unfamiliar with. Anybody know what it is? Is it Raku? Yeah, Raku. So until we know otherwise, it's Raku. 
<laughs> but uh, in terms of what it is, it's, um, it doesn't seem to fit the rest of the material. The materials themselves that are here, almost all of it is hospital material. So apothecary jars, the lips, if you look on the bottles, have either a, a glass or a cork tops. Um, almost all of the material is from a hospital until a second feature started to show itself near the end of the week. This is an example of one of the bags. You can see the condensation on the upper left. That's a no-no. So they went here. And they initially went there. On the right-hand side, you can see that they were being very careful about keeping it by its provenience and organizing it by the bone types in that provenience. And, and then it just became apparent how much was ahead of us. And in order to get this stuff out, it, it went on the shelves for drawing. We still have to return to it to finish it, that process. Now, one of the questions that was asked, I think when we'd gone this far into the feature was, <coughs> how many people are here? And uh, so we continued to make estimates of how many people there were as new and more information came in. As it stands right now, it's somewhere between 8 and 20 people. And we'll know more when we get all those bones organized and we can actually look at several different aspects of minimum number of individuals to understand how many are there. And the other thing that we're going to try and do is, is to try and determine how many full individuals there are which will be a much harder task that's going to require an osteologist and not us. By the way, an osteologist is the person who studies bones. And you'll hear more about them in just a moment. That's an example of the materials as it came in, a lot of sand on it. Um, we got the stuff up and out as quickly as we could, but this all needs to be cleaned up. Uh, we're finding uh, what's called cross-mending. And that is that between these, uh, eventually what we found were two features. One is the bone pit, which has a lot of trash in it in, with the bone. And the other one seems to be a straight hospital waste pit that has more domestic trash. So the bones that were in that part, there's lots of cut bone there too, but it's cow and pig and things like that. It's food. And uh, what we're finding is actually cross mending between those pieces parts of bottles that fit together that are in both, both of the features. And that's an important clue in terms of helping to gauge were both these features the same period of time and to tie the elements together. So this is the most prevalent artifact that's in there. There's only one complete one, but I think that we actually have many that are, are, have, have just been broken over time piece them back together. And these are hospital department bottles that were produced, and this is just the part I like the best, in Philadelphia between 1863 and 1865. How's that for type? Now that's when it's produced. Now the hospital is presumably built 1862, maybe three. The bottles come in as their production for the Civil War. But Glass lasts a little while. There's an heirloom effect. You get the bottle, you keep it for a while, and then it, it gets disposed of later. It lasts a shorter time than ceramics. And so literally there's like about a 10 to 15 year lifespan usually on a bottle. And this is <laughs> this has been worked out actually by archaeologists who probably spent their masters or their PhDs <laughs> trying to figure this out. And we thank them for that effort and hope they found better things to do. <laughs> <laughs> These little fragmented bottles, one of them, they have maker's marks on them, a very important tool in trying to gauge what's the age of these pits, where are they from, and what period of time. We know they're we're assuming they're hospital waste since they've got hospital waste in them, so it's from the building. And this one is squid. And these are from about 1867 to 1869. More of these are parts of squib produced these things. They're called apothecaries. And apothecaries is kind of like a, a, a chemistry set. 
And it's kind of like a whole series of the basic medicines that, that a surgeon or somebody who's working in one of these hospitals would need. They had simple paper labels on them, and they're produced in the 1860s and 70s. Another way of telling these things is also the way that the bottles are made. That the, the nature of the mold sometimes is more important in these earlier bottles. The way the glass was blown into a mold because there's fewer maker's marks on these earlier bottles. It's more the pattern of the technology of production that tells you what age they are. There's a, a couple of, of ale bottles that are usually, they didn't have maker's marks on them either. But generally, these are, this is pretty good ale. This is not cheap stuff. It's not made here. It comes all the way from Glasgow. And, and so this stuff was shipped over. And uh, there have been a number of these pieces found around those buildings, but these came out of the pit itself. Um, a few pieces we still don't understand yet, but they have some kind of maker's marks that has an enumeration on them. So it's from some kind of catalog, probably. And one that is uh, a druggist that uh, we couldn't find right off the bat. And I, I'm thinking we'll have to do a little research in the maybe to start with in just the San Francisco directories in order to try and find a guy named T. Wakeley who was producing something else they were picking up in this area. So there's more of it to go through. There's the example of the, the hospital bottle that's intact and the uh, Civil War period. So, that's the archaeology. That's the material remains. That's the way that we tried to bring them up out of the ground in a controlled fashion so we could reconstruct what the pit was, what was in the pit, and start to analyze what, what is the age of the pit, what kinds of pieces are in the pit, and then after all that, figure out what the meaning of this is. How did it end up? Is it just garbage? And what the meaning of this information is in relation to the hospital, maybe in relation to Point San Jose, maybe in relationship to the way that Western culture was operating at a certain point in time. So, the first thing I did is, I started the, the second part of this effort. And the second part of historical archaeology is the first part, historical. And so, when you dug up all these material remains, the idea of historical archaeology is you're supposed to be digging up the primary documents that reflect something about those material remains. So the first thing I did is I started doing some research on Point San Jose, not on Fort Mason. Fort Mason's a, a name that got created in 1882. This is in 1882. This is a little older than that. So I looked up Point San Jose Hospital and started finding a number of general surgeon reports that came out through the, the government printing office in the 1860s and 70s. Took a look at the reflections from the surgeons one page usually on each one of the forts and across the whole country, and started to come up with a number of names of the surgeons that actually worked at the hospital. This stuff, I didn't make up, okay? Where, I, where we go from here is just what fell in my lap, and it's not, uh, it sounds like a Leo story, but it isn't. It's just what I found. The first one I searched on, Edwin Bentley. He's an assistant surgeon, so he must not have been really a full surgeon yet. And uh, he's there from in charge of the hospital from 1869 to 1874. Well, that's pretty good. It's like it's right in that area that the artifacts seem to be suggesting that decade or so. And so I started looking into Edwin's past. In the Civil War, that's Edwin, the surgeon. He's uh, born in about 1822. He uh, is from Connecticut. He ends up in the Army as a US volunteer in the Civil War. He's in charge of the Alexandria Hospital during the Civil War and actually changes that place drastically from a hospital of 200 people to a hospital of 5,000. He, he almost does this stuff single-handedly, although he's still an assistant surgeon, so there's some story involved in that. And uh, 
After that, he's in several places, including Russell Barracks and a number of appointments that are actually in Washington, D.C. And then he's assigned to Point San Jose for this five-year stint or so. This is Edwin when he's a little older. And, uh, and basically, Edwin's career continues uh, well past the Point San Jose uh, episode. In fact, he lives into his 90s. And, uh, and this is what I think we're, where we're starting to find a little bit about what the pit might be. Edwin, it seems, was part of a large group of surgeons who were living up to the responsibilities set to them by the Surgeon General, who specifically asked for the U.S. Army surgeons to collect pathological and other intriguing anomalies in the process of working with soldiers and people that had been affected by the Civil War. So people coming into the hospitals, um, elements of their bodies that were, that were lost, where they died, or that would be, uh, uh, say, amputated or something. If there was something intriguing about it, and I'm not, I don't want to show you the pictures because although they're profuse, um, they, the uh, Army Medical Museum in Washington, D.C. on the National Mall was collecting these pieces and Edwin seems to have been really prolific at it and in fact began to send large amounts of material to the Army Medical Museum. I was able to download at least one of the catalogs of which there are six huge volumes that are produced from this Civil War effort by 1883. And in just one of the volumes, Edwin has produced almost more than anyone else. About 105 or so items are being sent from, usually a, a lot of these are from when he was at Alexandria. But it's an example of the things that he was doing in relationship to some, to that relationship he had as a researcher in the Western frontier to the Army Medical Museum and their efforts to understand how to deal with wounds of all sorts of types. The things that he sent forward were not all just bones. So they're anything that came under his knife. And so, for example, the very first thing he sends in is something called a hypertrophied heart. And the Army Medical Museum um, has many of these things. And, uh, and that's where the story starts to get a little more intriguing. Uh, that's an example of preparation with uh, anesthesia. Lister had started to develop the, the use of anesthesia, so they actually were able to get these guys somewhat quieted, amputations and other things occurred. And this is, an, this is the title page of, of like six huge volumes that were amassed of all the descriptions, artist renderings, photographs, and otherwise of uh, all the different people that had, uh, where information was being contributed by these surgeons from the Civil War and then beyond the Civil War. <clears throat> the curiosities that show up in the catalog are, uh, they get worse than this, but this is an example of them. And this is an example of the museum. So on the National Mall was this giant uh, yeah, what would uh, East Ventura say? It's like this giant place of death. And that takes us up to after the Civil War. In California, what continues during the Civil War and after is we don't have uh, any battles really here that relate to the Civil War, but we do have Indian Wars. And those things continue on up into the 1870s and 80s. One of the main ones that Bentley was involved in, at least as one of the two that I was able to find, is that he's assigned and runs the hospital at, during the Modoc War. And so he is at Gillum's camp at Tule Lake in uh, 1873 when uh, Captain Jack is eventually captured. The group is brought in and they're going to be, uh, well, eventually the Modoc are actually marched off in Oklahoma. And uh, in the process of that, a uh, very unfortunate circumstance occurs. 
There are no pictures at this point. Um, a Modoc Indian who was extremely despondent about being asked to either come to live on a reservation <coughs> with their known enemies, the Klamath tribes, and who will not go elsewhere, kills himself. And he's buried. Nonetheless, within a few weeks of that burial, the American Medical Museum receives portions of his head. And they are from Bentley. And they are uh, eventually portions of those are sent to the Smithsonian, <laughs> which was the, natural his the National Museum of Natural History at the time. In about 2007 and 8, the Smithsonian was going through its collections and identifying known individuals as part of the, it's kind of like the NAGPRA program. It's the law that's referred to as the Native American Graves Repatriation and Protection Act. They're looking at their collections and they come across this material that Bentley specifically sends to the museum and indicates it's from the Modoc War. It's this particular individual, Curly Head Jack. They make the effort to try and find lineal descendants and fail. And they eventually repatriate the remains to both the Klamath and to the Oklahoma Modoc. So, at that point, I didn't bring this up. No, it was a dark, stormy night. And it was Halloween. I was sitting on my computer watching Dawn of the Dead. to study uh, the morbid anatomy of mental illness. And it also turns out that October 31st, he shows up as being appointed the superintendent of the Napa Insane Asylum. Wow. Um, and uh, so the, the things that are revolving in my head at this point are right. Um, there's many things going on, but one of them is, um, is the need to think very differently about this pit. And whether right or wrong, and why it was done, or anything else, to be very cautious about the way these remains are being treated. And uh, because there's a thread that emerges in the work that Bentley was doing that suggests that we may actually have um, Native American people, and we definitely have odd circumstances when skulls and things are showing up in these burial pits. So there may be a NAGPRA issue that is sitting in this collection that's been recovered. And there also may be an issue about the inappropriate internment of human beings, period. So this is one of the reasons why, at this point, um, on November 18th, when we have the opening for the lab over at Fort Cronkite, we're not going to have this stuff out for you people to look at because it's not right anymore. This is it. It's one time the information is out, and, and maybe this was not correct either, but I had to do something, and I spent a lot of time thinking about this, and I thought the truth was kind of the best approach. So where we stand now with the discovery of the pits that were found, is that we need to con continue this historic research. I started using digital historic newspapers to see whether or not Bentley shows up. And he's showing up receiving a consignment from Montana. And that means a package is coming to him from out of the Indian territories. And there's also a, a uh, he's also reassigned at a certain point, right around the same time that uh, he's working at Napa, he also ends up being running part of the hospital at Surprise Valley up in the Warner Mountains, in, again in northeastern California. So there's enough indication from these few points that, that we've come across so far to, to have a concern about the actual clear identification, even if it's only in a statistical sense, of who these individuals might be. <coughs> 
there's a, a need to continue the, the cleaning up of the feature itself to, to clarify exactly the age of it because the story sounds very intriguing, but they're running parallel with each other right now. There's nothing in that pit that says, hi, I'm Edwin Bentley. There's just information that is just so damn close to, to the point of this pit. And the person is so prolific in the things that he's doing. He's a pathologist. He starts the medical department at Howard University. He's one of the founders of the Cooper Medical College in San Francisco that becomes the Stanford <coughs> Medical Institute. He's a pathologist, and yet there's elements here that seem pathological. That's... <laughs> we need to go to the National Museum of Health and Medi Medi Medical Medicine Archives. I think that's right. And uh, we actually need to make a, a thorough review of the materials that, that Bentley actually sent them because there may be enough information to know if we are able to reconstruct certain people with certain parts missing, or, or that we know something more about those parts that in terms of their, uh, the, uh, the genetic type that, or pool that they're from, whether they're Native American or whether they're Chinese or whatever they are, is trying to figure out whether or not there's any way we can know what to do with these things. And some of that information is in those archives. And finally, is getting a forensic osteologist, perhaps the guy that worked on Curly uh, Jack, a fellow by the name of Owsley. If we could get somebody like that to look at these materials, it'd be very important. But that work needs to be done. And I think we need to get the medical examiner back from the coroner's office and have them take a look at these materials, too. Strangely enough, Bentley was that person in 1874. <laughs> And he was the medical examiner for the, for the city of San Francisco. And so he shows up in articles all over the place as the expert witness. And in his studies of pathology, he's, uh, the materials that are in the ground are examples, potentially, of the Edwin Bentley pathology lab at Point San Jose that was then removed and put in the ground, maybe by someone after Bentley left who did not have the same predilections and who decided these things need to go away and they buried them. The pit reads exactly like an abandonment sequence like that, which is typical in archaeology when people leave a house and somebody else buys it. They come in and, and families often left lots of stuff behind. And they would take all that stuff because it didn't fit their way of doing things. And there'd be, you, you'll find the feature that's the abandonment clean-out feature. That's what that might be. And uh, the other thing is we need to sort of continue the process of monitoring the site. Because I think, if nothing else, there's good reason to try and keep an eye on it. And I think that's it. Yeah.